Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study, and uh, I'm glad that you're with us tonight and encourage you to share this with friends, and uh, hopefully we'll have uh, have some guests that will join us tonight. But uh, we are tonight uh, going to be uh, live online, of course, here, and uh, appreciate you being with us tonight and hope that uh, this time we spend together will bless you and encourage you. A couple quick announcements right now. Uh, we will have service on Sunday, uh, live in person. No Sunday school uh, with morning service. Uh, we'll make our decision on whether masks will be mandatory or just recommended uh, by, by Saturday. And uh, think about it, talk about it, look at current events and current, uh, current numbers and see if we want to stick with masks or just recommend masks. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll make that decision by Saturday, probably by noon on Saturday, probably before that. But uh, we'll see what the numbers look like. We haven't seen anything new from the county as far as the health department goes in the last couple of days, so we're looking forward to hearing that and seeing what's going to happen, and then uh, the board and I will discuss and make our decision week to week on what we're going to do. Uh, don't know yet about Sunday night or next Wednesday night, whether we'll meet in person or whether we'll continue to do this for another week or so. Probably because of school being out, we won't have kids' classes until school goes back on the 12th, which would put us on the 14th, coming back uh, to our regular Wednesday night schedule, and hopefully we'll be able to do that, and uh, we're counting on it. So. Anyway, this Sunday is BGMC Day, so bring your BGMC Buddy Barrel offering, tithes and offerings, and those kind of things. If you're not able to make it, hang on to it. Bring it when you are able to come. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, getting things back to normal again and uh, doing things the best way we can. We're trying to be safe. We're trying to be wise. We're trying to be smart about this. And uh, we certainly don't want to have any kind of an outbreak or even a case that's associated with this church as far as something happened inside these walls where we spread the virus or someone contracted it here. We don't want to contract it anywhere, but uh, we don't want to be the cause of our community having further spread or further issues with this thing. So we're being very, very careful, and uh, we need to be. And I think it's wise, and I appreciate our board. And uh, we work together on this. We talk about it. We brainstorm about it, and then we make our decisions. So we don't make these decisions lightly. We want to have church, and we want to have church in person. But we also want to do it the safest way possible, and that's why we that's why we did the mask. And I understand there's issues with the mask. I understand there's physical issues with the mask. There may even be philosophical issues with the mask or political issues with the mask. But nevertheless, we're trusting that that uh, what we do is best uh, for our church family, regardless of anything else, uh, any other factor you want to throw in. So uh, tonight, as we uh, get ready to get started tonight, let's pray, and we're going to start talking about the church at Philadelphia tonight. Father, in the name of Jesus, you know the needs of this church and church family. I plead your blood over us, God. I believe for those that may be sick with any, anything wrong with them, God, that you would touch them, heal them, bless them, renew them, and encourage them. Father, speak your blessing, body, mind, and spirit over this church and church family, those we love and care about. Father God, and we believe you tonight for your Holy Spirit to touch us through this time we spend together in your word, and that tonight, Lord God, would be a special time together in as much as it can be here online and with those later by DVD. And we thank you for it and love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, folks, tonight we are going to start talking about the church at Philadelphia. Now, the church at Philadelphia is a unique church because it doesn't have the issues that every other church has. You'll not see in your Bible that it has the heading, the faithful church, and this is the faithful church, and uh, we see things about it that we don't see with the other six, and, uh, and this is a, a unique church when it comes down to it. So we're going to look together at this for a little while tonight and uh, start reading in uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse number 7. And the word says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says, He who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Uh, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not but lie, indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet to know that I have loved you because you have kept my command to persevere and I'll also keep you from, excuse me, keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take away your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him a new name, 
uh, my new name, excuse me. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Lord, add your blessing to everything we do and say here tonight. So Philadelphia is a interesting place. We're going to kind of lay our groundwork in here and talk about the city of Philadelphia tonight. And the city of Philadelphia, that name Philadelphia we'll look at here together means brotherly love. And there's a Philadelphia here in Pennsylvania, and there's other Philadelphias around, but this one here is the one that has the notoriety. And the city of Philadelphia was a, a, a very important place. And their mission, because of where they're situated in, uh, in Asia, and they're in the, the province of Asia in uh, the Roman Empire, if we'll look here on the map together, we see here that in, um, hold on a second, let me pull this up the right way because it's not acting the way I want it to act. Um, we see here that you have the city of Asia that is situated, or not city of Asia, it's the city of Philadelphia. Uh, give me just a second, I'm working on getting this to, uh, to cooperate with me the way I want it to. Uh, so I can bring it up on screen for you instead of that little purple line that's there because that's not what I'm looking for here. Uh, but as I do this and as I get things sorted out and as I do this, and that puts it up where I want it to be, thank you. Uh, when you see this, this, uh, this, this, this picture here, you've got, as you remember, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Where Philadelphia is situated is the easternmost city in the province of, of Asia, and it takes you into Asia Minor and over on into Syria and so on. Um, in this province, in Turkey, modern-day Turkey, there is a city there now. Um, because this was located where it was located, it was a it was a um, a a uh, missions a missions place. Now we think about missions, we're thinking about uh, you know carrying the gospel, carrying Jesus, and of course that would be the connotation for the, uh, the Church of Philadelphia, but understand this about the, the city of Philadelphia, because it is, it is a, a prominent place, it is an important, an important geographical location here, you're dealing with a city that is, is a, a place that has prominence because it was known as, there's a, a historian named Strabo, uh, who's an ancient historian, and this city was called Little Athens. So Athens, Greece, was a certainly a predominant city and something that you know we we historically know a fair amount about, uh, and so the city of Philadelphia is located in such a way that Greek culture is being spread out into the e out into the east of there into the e eastern regions of, of Asia Minor and beyond. That culture is being spread out from there, um, and in the way that you would have a you know the influence of a city of this prominence. So. Um, the, the issue with Philadelphia and the reason why Philadelphia uh, ceased to be such an important, uh, sport, important place in the first century was because in 17 A.D., uh, because of volcanic activity around there, there was a massive earthquake that just that, that decimated it. So Tiberius was the emperor, the Roman emperor at that time, and he rebuilt it. And when he rebuilt the city, uh, there was a problem there because the people were afraid to live there because of the afraid of the earthquakes and because of the afraid that some of these structures, these buildings that were built there would fall in on them and they'd die. So they lived outside the city and in the, inside the city was magnificent. I mean, it was a beautiful, incredible place. And uh, today there is a modern Turkish city that stands there on top of those ruins in, uh, in Philadelphia. And that is a, it's still a place that you can go visit and go see today. Uh, but the, the, the prominence of that city is, is uh, not certainly what it was then. So as we, as we get started here tonight, we begin to look again at some of the kind of the passages we're leading into the introduction here to Philadelphia. Uh, when you look at verse 7 and 8, Jesus is speaking here. Now I don't have, I've only got the one Greek word for tonight, and that's the word Philadelphia. Uh, and we'll look at that in just a few minutes, and I've got one passage of Scripture to share with you tonight as we lay our foundation to kind of get our, our bearings here on the city of Philadelphia. But Jesus here says that uh, to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, write, these things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one's opens. He said, I see your work. See, I have set before you an open door. No one can shut it, for you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. And he goes on further to say, in verses 9 and 10, Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you because they have kept, because you have kept my command 
to persevere, uh, I'll also keep you from the hour of trial, which will come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So in, in the course of what he said so far, we see here the, the love of Jesus for his church, the, the feeling he has for them. And as we, as we listen to what he's saying, and we'll, we'll, we'll be breaking all this down in weeks to come, but as we look at it, we see what he's saying here. He has got nothing but commendation for these folks and how well they're doing and how they are, they are dealing with situations, dealing with circumstances, and they're doing it in the right way. And they are, they are overcoming. And verse number uh, 11 through 13, he goes on. He says, Behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take away your crown. He who overcomes, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, who, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I'll write on him my new name. There's so much there to unpack that we'll look at in the next couple of weeks. Of course, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So here in, in, uh, in this passage, we see that Jesus, as he does with the other six churches, says to the angel of the church in, and he's here, of course, is Philadelphia. And the city of Philadelphia, this is the eastern border, on the edge of on the eastern edge of Asia, and then when you leave there and you go east, you're going into Asia Minor, and you're going to Assyria uh, would be along the way there, and take you down that this way. This was foreign territory. This is this is not um, this is not a part of the 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 country that people would would go and feel at home. This is different. This is this is unusual. This is a, different from what they're used to in the Roman Empire, and so this city of Philadelphia was founded by a man named Eumenes II, and this was in honor of his brother Italus, uh, who he loved very much. Therefore, the name Philadelphia has to do with uh, that name brotherly love. I love my brother. Is, is basically what he named the city for is I love my brother. And we know that the word philos, which means which, which is a kind of love that was certainly spoke of in those days as well as still yet today, and that Adelphos um, is the, the word for brother. So it is literally brotherly love. Because the, 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 the name of the city would be anybody that knew Eumenes and his brother Italus would basically say, this is the city that was built because I love my brother. I care for my brother. And uh, this is commemoration of his brother. And because it's location, this is, a, this is a very important place for commerce and trade. Much like we see in the other seven churches, and we, well, like we see in the other, other six churches, rather, excuse me, but the other six churches, we see here this, this common link where you have a very prominent city, a very important city, you're dealing with commerce and trade, and you're dealing with a place that is, that is prominent, a place that has, uh, has notoriety. And as this, as this community was an open door to the east and that there's a great trade route, that much of that world that linked it with Europe to Asia, and this was an open door where everything that, that passed through going from any of these cities of, of, of the Roman Empire into Asia Minor and beyond would have passed through Philadelphia. So this is a strategic place. This is a place of great importance for its trade routes, for its commerce, uh, and for what people are doing there. They live there because they are a stopping point for people that's moving on into the east, and they would be a stopping point for people that are coming from the east, going west to the other, other cities of the Roman Empire and into Europe. So there's a, there's a, a tremendous aspect of this city that, uh, that was very important. And the city itself, King Italus, designed this city for commerce. And this would be a way that the Greek culture, the Greek language, and everything about uh, the Greek world would be carried into the rest of Asia, uh, in the rest of Asia, and into into other parts of the world, into these, into the to Asia Minor and beyond. And uh, so much of the influence of Philadelphia is seen and felt throughout the entire well, the, the entire known world at that time, two thousand years ago and beyond. And this is a city that it was very, very fantastically built. It had mag magnificent temples. It had other incredible public buildings. As I said at the outset there, it was, it was kind of thought of as a little Athens, Athens, Greece. And the importance of Athens was is certainly, I mean, we understand that it's still that today that it was a very, very important place. And much of what went on in the, in the world at that time came out of Athens. It was cultural. It was philosophical. It was, it was religion. Uh, now we're talking about pagan religions and much of the stuff that we're talking about with Athena and the other gods and goddesses of, of uh, the ancient world that uh, the mythology there but 
all around the city. There is temples. There's there's mineral hot springs because of the volcanic activity there. Uh, people came there because those waters had medicinal qualities, much like Hot Springs, Arkansas, uh, where we where we came from, and, and which we served in that that area of Arkansas uh, when we were in youth ministry and pastor, and we were we were within an hour of Hot Springs, and and there were people that would that would take and get big bottles or even gallon jugs and they would go to hot springs and they had particular places where you get that hot water right out of the right out of the source and uh, people came from all over the world really to see it and to experience that and um, go to the bathhouses and all that kind of stuff and and that was you know that's something that that I, I kind of I can imagine that because I've seen some of that kind of stuff and and you know know people that that um, that think that water is the water and of course you know I can't I've never found it around here that I can think of but mountain valley water if you ever get down the part of the country where they have Mountain Valley water, like bottled water that you'll buy at the gas station or buy at the store or whatever, Mountain Valley water is, I, I may be a little biased, but if I can find it, I drink that. It has absolutely no taste, no aftertaste. Some waters do. I don't know why they shouldn't. It's water. But nevertheless, that Mountain Valley water comes from Hot Springs, Arkansas. It is taken right out and put straight into bottles, and it is, it is the best water just hands down. I mean, there's not, there's not much better water that you can find in my opinion, and uh, I, uh, I, that's one thing. I, I've not found Mountain Valley water in a bottle up here in this part of the country, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's something like that. But So Philadelphia is a predominant place. It is an important place for where it's located, as we pointed out on the map. Uh, its place in relation to those other six churches and the other six cities that, had, that held the churches Jesus is speaking to here, as well as, Going on into the uh, into Asia Minor and beyond, out to the east, and um, the primary god of the city of Philadelphia was Dionysus. This is the god of wine, the god of revelry. So this was a party town, just just plain and simple. It was a party town, and because of that, again, like we're dealing with with the other other um, other issues, you have the 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 persecution. You have the uh, predominance of those things so if you're a Christian living in that culture and you are trying to do right and you're trying to live according to God's word and be obedient and be faithful there is more pressure there there is there is the possibility at least the temptation of uh, dealing with those things and obviously which we'll talk about in weeks to come in, in, in subsequent lessons there is the issue here of how they're dealing with the Jews because the Jews are giving them trouble and the Jews are, are acting out and causing problems and we'll uh, we'll discuss that as we go in future lessons so as we said Philadelphia had earthquakes uh, terrible earthquakes an earthquake destroyed literally destroyed the entire city in 17 AD and this uh, this at that point in time was part of the province of Asia and here's here's where you again run into trouble what happens when those kind of things happen well they want to rebuild it so what do they do they tax everybody in the city so uh, they live in a very opulent place a very beautiful place a very incredible place but they are, they are taxed so heavily and have to pay such hefty taxes to help rebuild the city that that makes it hard on them, hard on everybody, hard on believers, hard on unbelievers. And these earthquakes, they lasted for 20 years. So here you are living in fear, and uh, we've got friends and family and people that we know that have lived in places that are earth, earthquake-prone, uh, out in California and, and uh, other places, even down in Arkansas. There's earthquakes there, and occasionally there'll be one here, a small one here, but it's, it's uh, pretty uncommon. But... Uh, but nevertheless, you have these things going on. So, you know, you're trying to rebuild, and you, as you're rebuilding, well, there's an earthquake, and it shakes and tears things up and messes things up again. And there is a fear to live in there. There is, there's, you know, so, so what do they do? They go from outside the wall city out into villages and live out, out and about, out and around, where they're not going to be in danger, not going to be uh, looking at the possibility of having one of those buildings fall in on them because they're, because they're in, in harm's way. So this, uh, the city of Philadelphia remained a Roman town until 1379 when, it, when the Turks took it, which is modern-day Turkey, and there today is a Turkish city that's built there on what, uh, what would be the remains of Philadelphia. And the only things that's still there, there's a stadium there, there's the remnants of a theater, city walls, and a few structures downtown. Outside of that, it is a modern city. It's a current uh, city that's been built uh, over and over and, and built and rebuilt over the course of history. So as we think about this, and, and, and why is the city of Philadelphia's history important to us, so the same way it is for every other, every other situation, as we understand what the people of Philadelphia were experiencing, the Christians of Philadelphia and the Church of Philadelphia were experiencing, 
And we have a better understanding of why Jesus says what he says to them. And we've dealt with that. You know, we've talked about the other churches that the trade guilds were an issue. So if you're going to buy and sell and trade and, and live and make a living, if you get, if you get shut out of, these, of these, uh, these trade guilds because you're not willing to worship their gods, well, then you're in trouble. And here in Philadelphia, uh, because of where it's located uh, and the mindset of, well, we're Philadelphia and we're Greek, we're the Greeks, we're the Romans, and we're going to take this into the rest of the world. We're going into Assyria. We're going into these foreign lands, and we're going to let our influence be felt with those people. And it was their responsibility, much like a missionary is today, to go into foreign lands and go to places and take their, their you know, take what they have to other people. It was the very same kind of thing. They took their culture and their civilization uh, through the open door to the east of that day, and in in a in a, in a sense, they were a missionary city, and they took the Greek and Roman culture into uh, places that it wouldn't otherwise be uh, without that effort, without that, that determination, that, that, those kind of decisions. So eventually, uh, the church at Philadelphia assumes the same kind of role because of where they were, they had opportunities that other churches didn't have. As we've said, as we looked at the map here, I'll pull it back up because I think it's important to kind of have that, that visual, that image there. But as you look at the map here, and you see that you have uh, Ephesus in the bottom uh, bottom left and the farthest west, and then you go to Smyrna and Pergamos, and you go clockwise around to Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and then Laodicea, which Laodicea kind of takes us back on the road, uh, that circle, if you will, back toward Ephesus. But um, Philadelphia is sitting here in a, in a prime place, and they, as the same way as these people are experiencing Greek and Roman culture through the city of Philadelphia and through their influence and through who they are and what they are, uh, you have now the Asian world and Asia Minor and beyond that's experiencing Jesus Christ through the, the missionary effort of, of what was going on from the church in Philadelphia. And here's this open door they have. And as we think about that and we talk about that tonight, we're, we're looking at uh, and understanding as much as we can how when the, the love, the grace, the mercy, and everything that Jesus Christ gives us, whenever it gets, gets through to the heart of a person, we can't help but want to share, share him with other people. We can't help but want to share the gospel and the ministry and the, the, the work of the gospel with other people. But um, how do we do that? We do that through every, those around us. And whenever the opportunity presents itself, we do. We do want to go and do other things. We want to, we want to meet other people or go into other places. And and I can assure you, it's a life-changing thing, and I encourage you. We had Brother Rob Frazier with us a couple of weeks ago, and, and he talked about going and, and doing these short-term missions deals or going just for a few days or even for a day and helping out and doing something, even in some, you know, somewhere as close as Wichita or Kansas City, let alone going you know, somewhere else. And once, the, once all this pandemic stuff is behind us, hopefully maybe we can, we can put together a little group that will go somewhere to an inner city somewhere and help feed people and take care of people and clothe people and, and, and love on folks with the, go with the gospel here. Um, you know, and, and go and do, because I can tell you that the trips that I've got to go on and I've done, I got to go on a, a church that we're, a place where we built a church in, uh, in Venezuela. This has been a long time ago, um, when CJ was a baby. So this goes back 20, almost 25 years uh, thereabout. Um, and I got to go there. I've been, I've been over into, uh, to Asia and that wasn't a mission. That was a more of a, a fact finding, seeing what was going on trip. We got to see the water wells that were done by. BGMC and other things like that, which was which was very incredible, and got to meet some people, and and it was really awesome, uh, really incredible, and it was life changing in and of itself. Even though we didn't do any actual hands on ministry necessarily, and I did I did get to minister in a couple of ways that that uh, were were unique and unusual and and uh, pretty cool, and I've talked about in service before. I won't discuss here because this goes uh, anywhere that, that anybody's got the internet, and I sure, certainly wouldn't want to cause problems with what we're doing. Uh, in, in that respect, but um, we, we're careful with that kind of stuff. We have to be, and you know, when you think about these things, and we think about the, the the work and the ministry and the power of the Holy Spirit, and how God opens doors, and how God opened the door, the literal open door here for the church at Philadelphia to take the gospel into other places, and to be also a you know, this this just as important. If you have somebody who has a burden for. Um, Asia Minor from Ephesus or, or, or any of these other churches, well, they, they can go and the church at Philadelphia can say, hey, let us help you and let's go on. Uh, we'll, we'll send you that way. So, you know, 
what are the opportunities we have before us? What are the circumstances we have in our, in our world? Much the same as the church at Philadelphia. They had a culture and a mindset that said, let's take what we have and spread it abroad. And now the church at Philadelphia has the same heart and says, you know what? We've got something good here. We've got the gospel. We've got eternal life. So let's take this and let's go, uh, let's go into all the world. And they were fulfilling the Great Commission um, in, a, in a real tangible way by going from Philadelphia and into Asia Minor and beyond. And how many, how many people are in heaven today and will be in, through eternity because of, because of that heart and that attitude that says, I, I want to go. I want to do what I can do. And, you know, as we think about the world we live in, I want to conclude here and we're going to look at Ephesians chapter number 5. Is there on your study sheet if you printed it off or if you have it maybe on your computer, uh, however you may have it. But folks, when we think about what, what the Word says to us and, and, and what, this, what, what these things mean to us, I want to I wanna finish tonight with talking about Ephesians chapter number 5, 15 through 17. And here's what he said. He said, See then that you walk uh, circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. You know, a couple of things about this passage of Scripture that are really key and really important for us to get our mind around is, you know, paying attention. Walk circumspectly. Now, I've talked about this before, and this time of year especially, it, you know, it, it's something I think that can kind of, uh, we can get our mind around pretty good right here uh, in, in uh, northeast Kansas, really most of the Midwest, where you got deer. When you're driving, whether you're driving at night, driving daytime, and we're getting pretty close to the time here in another few weeks where it's not going to matter if it's midnight or noon, you may see deer somewhere, and you have a possibility of hitting one. Yesterday I was going to the woods, and the only deer I saw yesterday was one that I could have hit with my truck, but I slowed down because I was pretty sure what she was going to do, and she did it. She crossed right in front of me, literally right in front of my bumper, and had I not slowed down, I could have hit her. Um, the only opportunity I've had for a deer so far this year uh, that that I could have done something with I, that I that I might have done something with. I mean, I could I've had a couple of does and a and a little buck that stood in front of me, but but uh, that's not what not what I'm looking for at this point. But uh, you know, hoping hoping for for better things in the days to come. But but uh, on the point of what we're talking about here, to to walk circumspectly is to pay attention to what's going on around you. And we drive circumspectly because there's critters and animals, and somebody may pull out in front of us, or somebody's texting and driving, not paying attention, may. We may have to avoid them. Defensive driving is something that a uh, class that I have to take every year for bus driving, and, and it's, it's good because it helps you kind of get you thinking and get your mind on, you know what, you're, 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 you're not worried about what you're doing, but you're paying attention to what other folks are doing. And so we're paying attention to what's going on around us. That's what it means. So to walk circumspectly is to pay attention to what's happening all around you. Well, spiritually, what are we paying attention to? The signs of the times and the situations and circumstances, and we're being wise. He said not as fools, but as wise. And verse 16, and this, uh, this is a passage that's been on my heart here and uh, fits so much, so perfectly here in what we're talking about here tonight. So redeeming the time. Thank God that he gives us the time we have, that we live when we live, do what we do, have what we have. And Paul's writing this 2,000 years ago, but here today in, in the United States of America, we need to be redeeming the time. Because all around us, there's all kinds of stuff going on. And if we're not careful, we're... we're we're going to find ourselves wasting and doing and getting caught up in stuff we have no business getting caught up in. I talked Sunday about redemption, and this is one of those passages that the Bible talks about redemption. Redeeming the time is to take and make the best use and, and, and take that time because that time is precious, that time is valuable, and make the best use of that time. In verse 17, he says, Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. How do we know the will of the Lord? The word of the Lord. God's word is God's will, plain and simple. And from Genesis to Revelation, friends, we know what God wants, what God desires, what God expects, what we can expect from God. And having that understanding and having that, that, that desire to know and understand the will of God and to live according to that will and to live what God's word says we ought to live, neighbor, that is, that is everything that we should be in Christ. And that's, that's how we should be recognized. Is someone who knows what God's word says. We're living what God's word says. We're paying attention to what's going on around us. We are living in a wise and a, and a circumspect way. And we are doing the, making the most of the time we have. 
and doing the best we can do with what we have before us and uh, know and understand. A couple things he said there. He said, don't be unwise, don't be fools, and the days are evil. Look around us, neighbor. And this, this is nothing new. This is 2,000 years ago, and you can go back 4,000 years ago and 6,000 years ago. There's always been evil in this world because there's that evil influence in the world. But thank God there's always been those people who will walk circumspectly, who will look for wisdom, who will do the things they can do to understand and, and, and live the will and the word of God. And the church at Philadelphia, their notoriety and their distinction is known as the faithful church that we'll look at in more detail next week. That faithful church is because they walked circumspectly, because they were wise, because they redeemed their time, because they, they understood what the will of the Lord is. And the will of the Lord is life, an abundant life. It's, it's happiness and joy and strength. It's all the things the Word of God says we should have and we can have if, if we will find ourselves in that place. But we're living in a world today that Christianity is, is, is just under attack on every hand. And it's even more so now because there is a, a, uh, you know, a, a Supreme Court justice been, that's been nominated who is it about Christian? And oh, it's just I can't believe I can't, can't believe that, that, that they're going to do that. Why wouldn't they do that? Why can't a Christian be a good and a quality judge? And why can't, you know, as a Christian, certainly we see that, but the world should want that because Christianity should be, if it's lived properly, is about equity. It's about justice. It is about right, the right way of doing things and doing things the way they should be done by, that, that, would, that would be best for everybody. That's the way I see it. And I might, maybe I'm naive and maybe I, I've got a little, little different look at that than a lot of people have. But I'm telling you, there's, there's got to be something to be, there is something to be said, excuse me, let me rephrase there is something to be said for doing what is right based on God's word. And I know that's not popular. I know that's not the way most folks think. Uh, it's not the way a lot of folks that go to church think. Because we've gone into a cultural Christianity, we've gone into a, you know, going back to some of these other churches where they're just, they're following the crowd and they're trying to do whatever, whatever seems best to them even though they know that that's not what, God, what God's word says. What are we doing? How are we doing it? Why are we doing it? All of those, all those things, all those questions have the same, should have the same answer to the glory of God, to the glory of God the Father, because one day, one day we will stand before him, and one day he will speak to us, much the same way he's spoken to these seven churches and others throughout the word of God, and, he, and he's, got, he's got one of two things he'll say to every one of us, well done, my good and faithful servant, or depart from me, I never knew you. And if we didn't know him, it's because we didn't know his word, or we knew his word, but we didn't live according to that word. You know, our lips, our lips speak his praise, but our hearts are far from him. Why? Because, because of lots of things. Sin primarily. But friends, we have every day of our lives the opportunity to show this world a real, genuine, true Christianity. They've seen everything. They've seen the hypocrisy. They've seen the junk. They've seen everything just about that the church can possibly do to make itself look bad. And Christians that look bad and people that do stupid, sinful, awful things in the name of Christianity, in the name of Jesus. And we go back through history, we look at we look at right now in this world we live in today. And some of the stuff people say and do in the name of Jesus, essentially, because people know they're Christians or they're at least they, they think they are. Well, and the, you know, there's all the stuff that goes with that. It's sad. It's sad. And what what can we do to counter that? We can live, we can walk circumspectly. We can redeem our time, we can be wise, and we can understand the will of God. And the Holy Spirit will guide us, help us, and direct us. And everything that we need is right there in those pages of the Word of God. It's right there in the power and the work of the Holy Spirit. And we can have that same notoriety, that same confidence spoken by Jesus in who we are if we'll find ourselves in that place. Praise God. Comments or questions, if you have any, please comment those and and uh, add those there in the comment section for us if you wouldn't mind. And uh, good to see you there tonight. I, I see I see we've got a few people with us tonight, and I know that, that number kind of varies uh, uh, from, from time to time. I have figured out because I look, and it's like, well, there's only this number watching, and then I go back and look later, and, well, there's like 18 views of our video after the first few minutes, and it's like, okay, I don't, don't quite understand how that works. But uh, people are coming and going and, and different things going on and what have you. So... Anyway, thank you for being with me tonight. Thank you for your time. Uh, look forward to Sunday. It's going to be a great time. Please, as always, if you need anything, text me, call me, message me. Let me know what I can do for you, how I can pray for you, uh, anything else you may need.
and we're believing God for great things. We're believing God to get this virus uh, back under back under control and, and out of our out of our community, out of our county, out of our area, and out of this country, and out of this world. That, that God, by His power, could do that, and ask Him to do that every day. And uh, we're looking forward to great things in Him. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for this night. Thank you for these that have joined me. And Lord, let your Holy Spirit touch, encourage, and bless this each and every one. God, I speak blessings. I speak, I speak, Lord God, physical healing, renewal strength, your Holy Spirit power to touch us body, mind, and spirit tonight. And I thank you, Lord, for your word. And I thank you for the promises we find in it. And may, Lord God, we find ourselves living according to your will every day of our hearts and every day of our lives. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, friends, God bless you. Have a great rest of your night. And uh, hope that you are blessed and encouraged and have a wonderful evening.